Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So it is the Sunday that we uh, recognize, or it's called the day of the baptism of Christ. And so we read the story of Jesus' baptism uh, at the start of Epiphany. It coincides with the beginning of Epiphany. Does anybody know when the first day of Epiphany was? Yes, yes. And how did you celebrate that? Big party. It's my seventh birthday. birthday. Lots of ways to celebrate that. Yes, the Epiphany of our Lord, uh, and this follows that story, and it coincides with the Epiphany, the revelation of who Christ is, was, and always will be. But as I read that story, and as you hear that story, perhaps you've asked yourself at some point. The same question that many do is, why did Jesus need to be baptized? Was he repenting of his sins? Did he need the Holy Spirit? No, he didn't. Why did he get baptized? I have no idea. It remains a mystery. It is always going to be shrouded in mystery. Uh, let's add that to the long, long list of things that God does and did that we'll never understand. But uh, I do believe, and my thought in that is that uh, there's many reasons for it. One of it is for us to continue to celebrate what we call the sacrament of baptism, because Jesus did it. We, and he instructed us to do it, that we should also do it as well. But Jesus did this, I think, as a, a way, as an example for us to follow, to be baptized as well, or at least be encouraged to get baptized for all of the reasons that we believe baptism is meaningful in our lives. Now, understand that baptism is not the automatic get out of jail free, fast track to salvation. It is not. It is not a requirement of our faith. It is not a requirement of our salvation, uh, but it is something that we do quite frequently. So to clear up that misunderstanding, if there was any, um, it does have its benefits, though. And in the stories that I read, you heard primarily the thing that connected all of them together was the idea of the Holy Spirit. So rather than spend my sermon time speaking about why Jesus got baptized or what that meant for him, let's talk about the Holy Spirit and baptism for us. Uh, we don't talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. Not a big thing for Lutherans. We like the Father. We like the Son. <laughs> Holy Spirit's always there. Kind of that weird uncle that stands and that sits in the corner of the living room during holidays that no one's really sure what to do with or when he does something, we're kind of confused by what's happening. Um, that's, that's kind of how we deal with the Holy Spirit. But um, unfortunate as that is, I have opportunities every once in a while to talk about the Holy Spirit. And today is one of those days. The power 
of the Spirit. Um, and it's obvious from the reading of Genesis that the Spirit was there in the beginning, though not in that translation. Uh, in the NRSV, uh, there is a newer version of that that has a different, uh, different wording and translation in that, but it said at the beginning there was a formless void, basically chaos, that it, nothing existed, and that a wind hovered over the waters. Well, that wind is the Hebrew word ruah, which is the same word that we use to translate spirit. So the spirit was present. The spirit was the acting force of what God and what Christ were doing at creation, giving us the beginnings of what is our Trinitarian theology. Um, and it was in the chaos of what was a void, what was nothingness, which I still don't quite get how those two things work together, how there's chaos in nothingness. Well, I guess it's lacking order because there's nothing there. Um, but so you don't misunderstand, God created out of the nothingness, out of void. Uh, there wasn't building blocks and materials present at the beginning of creation when God created the heavens and the earth because then something else would have had to create those things in order for God to use them to create the heavens and, and the earth. And that, did, that creates problems for us having a singular God. Yeah, confusing, right? Um, so out of the nothingness and out of what was chaos, uh, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Did he speak things into creation? We don't know. Uh, did he think things into creation? I don't know. Does God think like we do? Probably not. Hopefully not. Um, nobody, uh, none of us were there to report that. So it's, uh, the creation story is not an eyewitness account. Um, and where it came from and its true meanings are um, still being debated today. But when this was written, sometime we believe during the exile of the, um, the during the exile of Jerusalem by the Babylonians uh, in the mid sixth century BC. That's what scholar when scholars think think it was written down in the form we have it today, not during the time of Moses. Uh, we don't believe that Moses actually wrote the book of Genesis or the other four books of. Uh, the Torah. I'm sorry if I'm misspelling a deeply held belief of yours, uh, but that's what scholarship does. Um, but the idea that there was this idea or thought that water is a part of that story, and that is related to the chaos. In that time and for most of the ancient civilization, water was thought of as the, as the most chaotic and turbulent and dangerous place you could ever be. Uh, people had not yet conquered the seas, um, and for those living in that area of Palestine, Jerusalem, not Jerusalem, but Galilee, uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee was one of those places that was very, very turbulent. So my understanding is, since I have not been there, that it can be beautifully calm and serene and peaceful and sunny when you start a journey out onto the Sea of Galilee and it can turn in an instant where the sea becomes incredibly turbulent. Think about the stories of the uh, apostles, the disciples leaving and going out on the sea to cross the sea and Jesus walking on the waters. It was a perfectly calm sea when they went out and then it became super turbulent because there was also this idea that there was demonic forces that kind of controlled the seas. So it was dangerous and turbulent. And here the message part of it in the creation story is that God is the one who calms and conquers and has authority over the things that we can't control, the turbulent things, the chaotic things in our world, God is the master of all of them. This is similar to what the meaning, I believe, of Jesus calming the seas is to identify him as God, having power over the things that we find to be out of control and chaotic. And in the epiphany of who God is and in the spirit of baptism, and we do use water as well symbolically in baptism, there's probably a bunch of reasons for that. One, it's fairly common. You can find it almost anywhere. But you don't have to baptize with water. You could baptize with Kool-Aid if you wanted to. That would be fine as well. Um, I know. It's <laughs> Lindy's shaking her head going, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, <laughs> 
But there is something for me that also symbolically, as we are baptized, as we are brought in and chosen by and gathered in by God um, through the waters of our baptism and through our faith, um, and receive the Holy Spirit in ways which we don't also understand. But there is this sense that the chaos that sin creates in our world and our life. Again, keep in mind in the creation story, everything was perfect out of chaos. And then Adam and Eve did their thing and kind of messed it all up. And chaos returned back into our world. And we live in that chaotic world. And, and chaos for me is, is, can be defined as it's something has gone awry and it's not the way it was intended to be. That something as it was created out of perfection by a perfect God has kind of short-circuited and become something that it was never intended to be. And that is also, I believe, a reflection of humanity and what sin did to us. The Garden of Eden was perfect and harmonious and there was relationship and intimacy and fellowship with God and then sin changed everything and the world was turned upside down and we were turned upside down and there was separation between us and God. There was chaos. And in Christ coming, in his incarnation and coming to be one of us and, and receiving that baptism and all that we understand that it means that we are claimed and chosen by God. But I think also it is a restoration for us because we are washed clean. We are in, in essence at least literally but at the same time metaphorically become sinless that the chaos that is a part of us that separates us from God, that is sin, is wiped away, symbolically, but also literally. And there is a return to harmony. There is a return to the essential design of who God created us to be in perfect relationship with him. And just as God did all of the creating part, he initiates that process in us as well in the symbolism and in the literal meaning of what baptism is, the chaos in us, which is again that separation from God, is taken away. And the Spirit does that in our baptism. And it is a reminder of us of who we are then. That even in the midst of a chaotic and challenging and difficult and broken world, there is this inbreaking of heaven, just as there was at Jesus' baptism, when the heavens were torn apart, torn asunder, and that dove descended on Jesus. The world of the perfect creation in heaven came into and became a part of this chaotic and broken world. And that is still a big part of the mystery of what God is doing. It's near the top of the list that we have this perfect harmony with God that exists in the kingdom of heaven at the same time the chaos and darkness that exists in our world. And we balance in those two things And the rub, well, and in that telling of the baptism of Christ, in addition to the heavens being torn apart and descending upon Jesus, there is that voice that also comes from heaven, the voice of God, identifying Jesus as his beloved son. So that we who read that story, we who hear that, can understand that he was not just a human being, but that he was that same God that was present at the point of creation. And because of the authority he has over the chaos of nothingness, and because of who he is as divine, has that same power over chaos that exists in our world and our lives. 
It's not an automatic switch that gets flipped. When we baptize infants, they don't suddenly become these perfect creatures or creations. But I think there is something interesting to the frequency with which infants, when they are baptized, feel that water on their head for the first time, sometimes tend to cry out and resist maybe just at the core of who they are being claimed by the one who smooths out all the chaos, makes those crooked roads straight and those mountains flat, and paves the way for us because of the sin that is a part of us even at birth, to resist that. And so it's not an automatic thing because it's not completely taken away from us. And so we live in the reality of this world and our own brokenness and the messages we hear from this world. But there is also that truth, just as it was spoken over Jesus at his baptism, that you are my beloved child. And with you, I am well pleased. And I think symbolically, because Jesus did that, we too, because we are united with him, experience the same thing. And the power of it was not just in that one instant when it took place, but the power of it continues on forever. And we who hear that as an infant don't remember it, but we as adults or as adolescents or of those who just believe that have faith, that those words are spoken over us constantly. And it's up to us to live into that truth when the world and our circumstances are telling us something else. That in all of the chaos that we experience, it is not evidence of a separation from God. It is evidence that sin exists in our world and that we definitely need a savior because we can't take care of the problem of sin, but that God speaks those words over us in our best and in our worst moments. You are my beloved sons and daughters. And with you, God is always, always well pleased. That's pretty amazing. Because I don't always feel like I am that beloved child of God and always doing the right thing. And reminding myself and trying to do a better job of reminding myself of that on a regular basis that I am who God says I am and I am not who I tell myself that I am or who this world tells me that I am. That my belovedness is not based on the things that I do or don't do, the things that I say or don't say, that it is based on the one who created the heavens and the earth who spoke or thought or just flashed everything into existence, who chose me at my baptism, who chose me at that point of faith when I recognized the infinite grace and love of who God is, that that very one looks at me and sees me as beloved. There is power in that. There is infinite power in that. So today I remind you of that. No matter what's happening in your life, no matter how you're feeling about yourself, I hope you leave here today hearing and feeling those same words. That you are and will always be, have always been a daughter or a son of God. And that with you, he is well pleased.